with plastic gloves. Jesus Christ, Sandy. It wasn't quite a head. Only half a head. Dr. Abel Sante's head had been cleanly separated from the rest of his body like an expensive cut of meat. It was sliced in half. The face was washed, the skin carefully pulled away. Only half of Sante's mouth screamed at us. A single eye reflected a moment of ultimate terror. You're right. It is just me to him, Sandy said. How can you stand being right about him all the time? I can't, I whispered. I can't stand it at all. My first morning back in Washington, I decided to visit the Cross House on 5th Street again. I needed to look over Cross's notes on Gary Sinigi one more time. I had a deepening sense that Alex Cross knew his assailant, had met the person at some time before the vicious attack. As I drove to the house through the crowded D.C. streets, I went over the physical evidence again. The first really significant clue was that the bedroom where Cross was attacked had been tightly controlled. There was little or no evidence of chaos, of someone being out of his mind. The other significant factor was the evidence of overkill in the bedroom. Cross had been struck half a dozen times before he was shot. That would seem to conflict with the tight control at the crime scene, but I didn't think so. Whoever came to the house had a deep hatred for Cross. Once inside the house, the attacker operated as Soniji would have. The assailant had hidden in the cellar. Then he copycatted an earlier attack Soniji had made at the house. No weapons had been found, so the attacker was definitely clear-headed. No souvenirs had been taken from Cross's room. Alex Cross's detective shield had been left behind. The attacker wanted it found. What did that tell me? That the killer was proud of what he had accomplished? Finally, I kept returning to the single most striking and meaningful clue so far. It had jumped at me from the first moment I arrived on Fifth Street and began to collect data. The attacker had left Alex Cross and his family alive. Even if Cross died, the assailant had departed from the house with the knowledge that Cross was still breathing. Why would the intruder do that? He could have killed Cross. Or was it always part of a plan to leave Cross alive? If so, why? The house was quiet, and it had a sad and empty feeling, as houses do when a big, important piece of the family was missing. I could see Nana Mama working feverishly in her kitchen. The smell of baking bread, roast chicken, and baked sweet potatoes flowed through the house, and it was soothing and reassuring. She was lost in her cooking, and I didn't want to disturb her. Is she okay? I asked Samson. He had agreed to meet me at the house, though I could tell he was still angry about my leaving the case for a few days. He shrugged his shoulders. She won't accept that Alex isn't coming back, if that's what you mean. If he dies, I don't know what will happen to her. Samson and I climbed the stairs in silence. We were in the hallway when the cross children appeared out of a side bedroom. I hadn't formally met Damon and Jenny, but I had heard about them. They had inherited Alex's good looks. They had bright eyes, and their intelligence showed. This is Mr. Pierce. He's a friend of ours. He's one of the good guys. I spent the next hour and a half going over Cross's extensive notes and files on Gary Sinigi. I was looking for Sinigi's partner. John Sampson and I boarded an FBI Belljet Ranger about 11 the following morning. We had packed for a couple of days' stay. So who is this partner of Sinigi's? When do I get to meet him? You already have, I told him. We arrived in Princeton before noon and went to see a man named Simon Conklin. Sampson and Cross had questioned him before. Alex Cross had written several pages of notes on Conklin during the investigation of the sensational kidnapping of two young children a few years back, Maggie Rose Dunn and Michael Shrimpy Goldberg. The FBI had never really followed up on the extensive reports at the time. They wanted the high-profile kidnapping case closed. I'd read the notes through a couple of times now. Simon Conklin and Gary had grown up on the same country road a few miles outside the town of Princeton. The two friends thought of themselves as superior to other kids, and even to most adults. 
Gary had called himself and Conklin the Great Ones. Cross double underscored in the notes that Gary had been in the bottom fifth of his class at Princeton High School before he transferred to the Petty School. Simon Conklin had been number one and gone on to Princeton University. A few minutes past noon, Samson and I stepped out into the dirt and gravel parking lot of a dreary little strip mall between Princeton and Trenton, New Jersey. Princeton education sure worked out well for Conklin, Samson said with sarcasm in his voice. I'm really impressed. For the past two years, Simon Conklin had managed an adult bookstore in the dilapidated strip mall. The store was located in a single-story red brick building. We walked inside the seedy, grungy store and flashed our badges. Conklin stepped out from behind a raised counter. He was tall and gangly and painfully thin. His milky brown eyes were distant as if he were someplace else. I'm starting to enjoy these unexpected visits from you assholes. I didn't at first, but now I'm getting into them, he said. I remember you, Detective Sampson, but you're new to the traveling team. You must be Alex Cross's unworthy replacement. Conklin spoke with a jaw-cracking yawn. When Alex Cross got shot, I was with a friend all night. Your very thorough cohorts already spoke to my squeeze, Dana. We were at a party in Hopewell till around midnight. Lots and lots of witnesses. I nodded, looked as bored as he did. On another more promising subject, tell me what happened to Gary's trains, the ones he stole from his stepbrother. Conklin wasn't smiling any more. Look, actually, I'm getting a little tired of the bullshit. Gary and I were friends until we were around twelve years old. After that, we never spent time together. He had his friends, and so did I. The end. Now get the hell out of here. I shook my head. No, no, Gary never had any other friends. He only had time for the great ones. He believed you were one of them. He told that to Alex Cross. I think you were Gary's friend until he died. That's why you hated Dr. Cross. You had a reason to attack his house. You had a motive, Conklin, and you're the only one who did. Conklin snorted out of his nose and the side of his mouth again. <laughs> And if you can prove that, then I go directly to jail. I do not pass go. But you can't prove it. Dana, Hopewell, several witnesses. Bye-bye, assholes. I walked out the front door of the adult bookstore. I stood in the blazing heat of the parking lot and waited for Samson to catch up with me. What the hell's going on? Why did you just walk out like that? Conklin is the leader, I said. Soniji was the follower. For the next few days, Samson and I kept Simon Conklin under surveillance. We let him know we were there, waiting and watching, always just around the next corner and the corner after that. I wanted to see if we could pressure Conklin into a telling action or even a mistake. Conklin's reply was an occasional jaunty salute with his middle finger. I could tell we were unnerving him. John Sampson had to return to Washington after a few days. I had expected that. The D.C. Police Department couldn't let him work the case indefinitely. Besides, Alex Cross and his family needed Sampson in Washington. I was alone in Princeton. The way I liked it, actually. Simon Conklin left his house on Tuesday night. After some maneuvering of my own, I followed in my Ford Escort. I let him see me early on. Then I dropped back in the heavy traffic out near the malls, and I let him go free. I drove straight back to his house and parked off the main road, which is hidden from sight by thick scrub pines and brambles. I walked through the dense woods as quickly as I could. I knew I might not have a lot of time. No flashlight, no lights of any kind. I knew where I was going now. I had figured it all out. I understood the game now, and my part in it. My sixth sense was active. The house was brick and wood, and it had a quirky hexagonal window in the front. It was more than a mile from the closest neighbor. No one would see me break in through the kitchen door. I was aware that Simon Conklin might circle back behind me, if he was as bright as he thought he was, 
I wasn't worried about that. I had a working theory about Conklin and his visit to Cross's house. I needed to test it out. The inside of the house was absolutely unbearable. Every room and every object was coated with dust and grime. The best that could be said of Simon Conklin was that he was an avid reader. Volumes were spread open in every room, half a dozen on his bed alone. He seemed to favor sociology, philosophy, and psychology. Marx, Jung, Bruno Betelheim, Marot, Jean Baudrillard. Three unpainted floor-to-ceiling bookcases were crammed with books piled horizontally. All of this fit with what had really happened at Alex Cross's house. Over Conklin's rumpled, unmade bed was a framed Vargas girl signed by the model with a lipstick kiss next to the butt. A rifle was stashed under the bed. It was a Browning B.A.R., the same model Gary Sunigi had used in Washington. A smile slowly broke across my face. Simon Conklin knew the rifle was circumstantial evidence that it proved nothing about his guilt or innocence. He wanted it found. He wanted Cross's badge found. He liked to play games. I climbed down creaking wooden stairs to the basement. I kept the house lights off and used only my pen light. There were no windows in the cellar. Curled photographic prints were clipped to strings dangling from the ceiling. I examined the dangling pictures. They were photos of Simon Conklin himself, different pics of the auteur cavorting in the buff. They appeared to have been taken inside the house. I shined the light haphazardly around the basement, glancing everywhere. The floor was dirt, and there were large rocks on which the old house was built. Ancient medical equipment was stored, a walker, an aluminum-framed potty, an oxygen tank with hoses and gauges still attached, a glucose monitor. My eyes trailed over to the far side, the southern wall of the house. Gary Sunigi's train set. I was in the house of Gary's best friend, his only friend in the world, the man who had attacked Alex Cross and his family in Washington. I was certain of it. I was certain I had solved the case. I was better than Alex Cross. There, I said it. The truth begins. Who is the cat? Who is the mouse? A dozen of the best FBI agents available stood in an informal grouping on the airfield in Quantico, Virginia. Directly behind them, two jet black helicopters were waiting for takeoff. The agents couldn't have looked more solemn or attentive, but also puzzled. As I stood before them, my legs were shaking. My knees were hitting together. For those of you who don't know me, I said, I'm Alex Cross. I could see by their faces some of the agents remained confused. I couldn't blame them, but I also knew that what had happened was necessary. It seemed like the only way to catch a terrifying and diabolical killer. As you all can see, rumors of my imminent demise have been greatly exaggerated. I'm just fine, actually, I said, and cracked a smile. The official statements out of St. Anthony's Hospital, not expected to live, very grave condition, highly unusual for somebody in Dr. Cross's condition to pull through, were overstatements and sometimes outright lies. The releases were manufactured for Thomas Pierce's benefit. The releases were a hoax. If you want to blame someone, blame Kyle Craig, I said. Yes, definitely blame me. Kyle was standing at my side along with John Sampson and Sandra Greenberg from Interpol. Alex didn't want to go this way. Actually, he didn't want any involvement at all, if my memory serves me. That's right. But now I am involved. I'm in this up to my eyebrows. Soon you will be too. Kyle and I are going to tell you everything. Four years ago, a recent Harvard Medical School grad named Thomas Pierce discovered his girlfriend murdered in their apartment in Cambridge. That was the police finding at the time. It was later corroborated by the Bureau. Now let me tell you what Kyle and I believe really happened. This is how it went down that night in Cambridge. Isabella Calais. Thomas Pierce had spent the early part of the night out drinking with friends at a bar called Julian's in Cambridge. 
The friends were recent 